I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about support. So when you're going through a struggle, there's a beginning, middle, and an end. And right now you may be stuck in the messy middle and it can be filled with uncertainty, especially during, as I'm recording this right now, we're in the middle of COVID. Uh, the fertility journey, asking for support, sometimes we just don't know where to go for that support. We, some of the support we might be having could be harmful and there could be resistance to even asking for support in the first place. So we're going to talk about some tips to help you right now figure out how to really get connection, the right connection when you're going through fertility and what to look for as far as your support team. So thanks for listening. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step -step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take a few minutes right now, you can pause this, this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. Hey there. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time falling asleep, waking up at night, or feeling tired when we wake up, sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. And melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. There's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent uh, frame and they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer range. So this is exact range has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. So I got to say I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I, did, I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day and I have to say after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription and reading glasses. Plus you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Use the coupon code get pregnant podcast at checkout and receive a 15% discount. That's blue blocks, B L U B L O X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast to receive your 15% discount. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously mm -hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently restored. I was still cycling back in my, in my twenties. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. 
It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, the founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Elise Ash to the podcast, and we're digging into why support is so important during the fertility journey. So Elise Ash is a writer, speaker, and the founder of Fruitful Fertility. And thanks so much for listening. I'm really so thankful that you are here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Elise, excited to have you on the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, if you could share your journey. I think a lot of people that most people that I speak to that have come to this field of, of work have their own journey. So if you could share with our listeners. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be on the podcast. My story starts out probably like a lot of other people's where always wanted to have kids, uh, was excited to be a mom at some point in my future, found a great guy, got married, did the standard safe option. We're focused on our careers. We bought a home. We traveled. We went to baseball games. We were going to restaurants. We did basically like everything we wanted to do. We're really happy. And then when we were ready to finally start having our family, we realized, wow, it's going to be a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. And really started dealing with this month over month disappointment and the month over month trying, trying, trying. And I think it was especially hard for us as well because I am a very type A person. <laughs> and so we never really had uh, a period of trying that was relaxed or chill or fun. We kind of went preventing pregnancy to actively trying, charting, tracking, you know, mm. keeping track with the apps and um, the ovulation predictor kits and all that stuff uh, really quickly. So we really didn't get that fun, flirty, you know, let's just see what happens kind of period. Um, and then went for about a year and change before going to a doctor and learning that I had cysts on my ovaries and was given a endometriosis diagnosis. That was really um, a turning point for us, both physically, of course, because we had a diagnosis and we could all of a sudden start looking at what a future treatment might be. But it also was a turning point emotionally because up until that point, I think my husband had been very much on the side of like, nothing's wrong, everything's fine, it can take a while, just relax. Like he was kind of echoing a lot of the, the sentiments that I was hearing from family and friends who were well-meaning, but not necessarily very helpful. And so I think when we got that diagnosis, it really did realize, oh my gosh, there is something medically happening as opposed to just this is something fictionalized in my head, or this is just me being impatient. So that was really a big turning point for us after getting that endometriosis diagnosis. And we had one failed round of IVF that resulted in no chromosomally normal embryos. So we had nothing to transfer. And then we kind of went back to the drawing board for a couple months to see, is this something we want to do again? Is there a different protocol that we want to try with our provider? Um, we did decide to do a second round, which went a lot better. And we did end up having a frozen embryo transfer, which was successful. So throughout the process, I really just realized how hard this journey was. And especially for someone like me who loves control. And I realized, wow, if this is so hard for me and I already feel like I have a great partner, I have financial resources to you know, pursue treatment if I want to, I have um, resources to go to a therapist if I need to, I can't imagine what this would be like for somebody who really felt 
incredibly alone and didn't have any of these support networks. So that was really when I had the idea for Fruitful, which is a fertility mentorship service where we connect people who are struggling emotionally through infertility with somebody who's been through it before, but is now on the other side. So I'd had that idea to create some type of service that was similar to an Alcoholics Anonymous, where, you know, you join, you speak the same language as everyone else, you all can have empathy for one another, but you really have that one person who's that big sister, big brother, who can help kind of guide you along through the emotions of the journey. Yeah, I think that's, the, 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 I love this, your, your program, the mentor and the men- mentee, and just really having someone on the other side. And when you talked about, and the same with, I work with type A's and control, <laughs> same thing for me, like, I want to plan it, plan A, B, C, yeah. D. Yeah, and you're talking about, and then you get then you find out some of the things that you're thinking might go wrong and then then it wasn't in your head it was then legitimized by you know that you actually have a diagnosis and there's something going on with endo and cysts and then you talked about those well-meaning comments from friends and family which we all hear like the relax or go on vacation that kind of stuff and you just want to slap them because sort of you know although it is well-meaning it is completely unhelpful Well, and I think that was really my aha moment for Fruitful was I'm speaking a different language than than a lot of my friends and family who have never had to deal with this and who don't know anything about it beyond like a plot line on Real Housewives. It's like, bless them, they're all trying their best and I don't expect them to understand. But it was definitely a huge miss for me and it oftentimes left me feeling more lonely than before I'd reached out in the first place. So I was starting to look at other places for emotional support. I'd found a fertility yoga group that was an in-person yoga group that I loved. But the problem with that was that everyone was on a different timeline in the group. And so you had people who were actively going through treatment who were then sort of like, quote unquote, graduating if when they were having success and it was leaving a bunch of us behind and it created this really weird competitive dynamic that I don't think any of us really liked or felt positively about. And I think that was one of the problems I was trying to solve with fruitful as opposed to a cycle buddy system where, okay, we're all getting ready to go through stims together. We're all getting ready to, you know, do our ovulation together, whatever that is. There does sometimes, there there can be this type of competitive feeling or how many embryos do you get? Like how many fertilized? What's, What's your course of action? What are you doing? I think too often, and especially in a lot of these like Facebook groups and Instagram communities, we're just, we're all comparing ourselves to one another. And for me, that felt really overwhelming. Yeah, the comparison thing is a huge trigger in, in really all aspects of life, but especially in this, when you're like looking at, especially if someone's posting their their baby pictures and you know they're seemingly moving on with their life while you're feeling stuck in that comparison, especially, yeah, when you're both going through a, being a cycle buddy, you're both going through the same thing. And then you end up, if you are that competitive person, that you just then it just gets into this kind of ugly, ugly mind space, which is completely unhelpful. And I think also it is, even if you don't want to feel competitive about it, like the most evolved person, I think Mm. it's only human nature though, to Mm. feel a little bit uncomfortable if somebody's complaining, oh, we only got, you know, three embryos and I'm nervous about that. And then you're thinking like, oh my gosh, I would kill for three chances. Wow. Oh my God. Like when other people sometimes complain or vent or are upset with their results and your results are worse, it can be like, oh my gosh, wow, I don't really feel feel safe in this community anymore. Yeah. The same with secondary and primary infertility being with people. Yeah. You know, secondary infertility is just as painful, sometimes even worse because you see a little person in your family that should be there and there's this empty spot, not even to compare pain, but sometimes people may look at that and go, well, you should be grateful to even to have one. But infertility, all aspects, wherever you are, there is pain and each person's pain is valid. Totally. And I think that's something that's really important to remember is, you know, this isn't a suffering competition. There's always going to be somebody out there who went through more rounds, suffered longer, had a worse experience, had a later loss. Had, you know, there's always going to be somebody who, you know, had something worse, but that doesn't mean that you don't get to feel sad about your loss. That doesn't mean that you don't get to grieve that what happened to you isn't valid or doesn't matter. It really, really does. And I think I was thinking about it the other day and I actually, I think this was a meme I saw on Instagram, but it was saying, um, and it has just stuck with me. I saw this a few weeks ago. It was saying that if we take this idea of you can only be sad if you have the worst scenario, if you have it worse than everybody else, then does that mean you can only feel joy if you have it better than everyone? And that was something I was thinking about a lot. Like, okay, yeah, am I not 
can I still have a good day, even though my day isn't like Beyonce's good day? You know, like my good day is still pretty good. Yeah, to see what that's, it, again, that's the comparison thing too. Because I know when just bringing up Beyonce, when she got pregnant with twins, like the infertility of the community went bananas. Going, oh my goodness, even Beyonce is pregnant. This is crazy. You know, what about me? But I, we don't know if she had IVF. You you would assume, you can make an assumption, you know, that she, because I thought she had a miscarriage in there. Like we don't know people's what's going on with, you know, no. their specific journey and especially with celebrities and more celebrities are becoming, are being more vocal about this, but, um, there is that whole comparison thing that just goes down that, that ugly slip, slippery slope. And even for me, like having both my kids with donor eggs, like I didn't even, when I was going through that, like if you were to look at this, people might say donor eggs would be, oh my goodness, that's like the last thing I, like after I've done everything, that's what I've, that's what I'm going to. I don't know, like, cause I didn't, I don't know what I was doing back then, but I was completely disconnected from my body, didn't get the second opinion. And I actually thought I had framed it in my mind that other people that had to go through years of treatment had it worse than me that I actually was more fortunate. But like it, some of that stuff is like mindset things. And, and I didn't have anyone to help me back then. And now there's, there's so much more support and the mindset and how you look at, how you look at things is, is so key. So can you talk a little bit? Here we are recording this in the middle of the pandemic. We're all at home, which, you know, we have Zoom and, and things like that to connect with others. But, um, what's, why is connection so important during the fertility journey? Well, I think connection was, you know, a key component in, you know, going through infertility, you know, before any of this COVID stuff. And and I think it's also just something that can be a little tricky because it is a really personal, private thing, health issue that a lot of people go through and a lot of people don't feel comfortable sharing it either with family or loved ones or, you know, broadly across, you know, social media and stuff like that. And I think it's always been about being able to find the support that works for you. And I think that's the key component in all of it is realizing there isn't one size fits all form of emotional support out there. There's a bunch of different ways people can get support. And we're seeing that now with COVID too. You know, something that makes me feel good is, you know, I really like doodling. I like doodling and drawing. You know, I like turning on my music. I like listening to podcasts. I like taking a little walk. Those are things that help ground and center me. I know my husband, Brad, likes cooking. I know he likes working and know he likes staying distracted. For me, it's been a little bit tougher to work um, because I've been, you know, stressed out about what's going on like everybody else. And I think what you really need to do is touch base with yourself and figure out what does feel good. Does it feel good to join a bunch of these, you know, private Facebook groups about infertility and vent about what's going on? For some people, it feels really good. For other people, it might feel completely overwhelming. So I think it's really about how do you find those tools in your tool belt? How do you find those different communities, people, relationships, hobbies, ways of processing what's happening to you and kind of put together your own self-care plan? And I hate that self-care has become this kind of like buzzwordy thing for you know, face masks. <laughs> like that's not yeah, what I'm many, talking about. Not- pitties. Yeah, that's like not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm talking about with self-care is really being able to listen to what you, you specifically need at any given time. And it's going to look totally different than what your best friend needs or than what your partner needs. And just really being able to, to figure out what is at the root of it. Do you need to go for a little bike ride? Do you need to maybe write down some of your feelings? Do you need to call, you know, your mom? Do you need to, you know, create a private Instagram account because you need like a place to vent, but also some space where people can can see, you know, what is it that you need? So I think it is cool that we're living during a time where there are so many resources and there are a ton of ways that technology is allowing us to connect in ways that feel good without the parts that feel bad. You know, I love that Instagram and Facebook have added these features where you can kind of like mute people or unfollow them even if you want to stay friends. Um, I think that's exactly the kind of thing that we all need to be really vigilant in doing and just being honest with ourselves about what's working and what isn't at any given time. Yeah, really the key, yeah, with self-awareness, what do you need? And we can mm-hmm. talk about medicine meditation and and fertility yoga and journaling and maybe all those make you want to run for the hills and for you it's you know going out in nature but it's that self-awareness when you're during during a stressful time and I find myself during a stressful time I typically let go of all the things that freaking help me I let go of like <laughs> I let go of the meditation like yesterday I, I was eating my lunch at 3 30 I didn't I usually go for a walk with the dog like twice I didn't get up for a walk at all yesterday it was just an overly busy day at the end of the day. And then I, and I need, I need a little bit of time at the end of the day to wind down, either at reading or watching a show. 
um, and I like to have a little snack. And, and so it's like my whole day had completely exploded and I didn't get some of the stuff that I need. And I sort of, when I'm coaching clients, we're like, what are your three big rocks? Like, what are the things that mm -hmm. if you don't get each day? Like the whole, so it's like that little, that if you have a, a jar and you put in the, the, the sand, the water, the little pebbles, then you try to put the three big rocks and they won't fit. But if you put the three big rocks in first and then you put the other stuff in, it all fits. So it's like, for me, it's making sure I eat properly. Like, you know, it mm -hmm. seems very simple, but getting three meals a day, for me, also getting outside and for, for my big rock would probably be, um, yeah, being outside in nature and, and moving. And also I like, like I process my, my thoughts by talking and my, mm -hmm. and my poor husband has to listen to me, but usually <laughs> it's not like a, it doesn't go on forever, but I, that's how I get it out. And then I'm able to move on. Other people may want to, you know, journal it and write it. And you can do that, um, that writing exercise in the morning where you just kind of do that stream of consciousness and write it and you can burn it or throw it out kind of being able to, to process that, process that. But I think, yeah, self-awareness as to what it is you need. If you're on Instagram and you're on Facebook or you're in some of these groups and afterwards you're kind of like, eh, you're not feeling that great to be aware of that, to see, you know, was it helpful for you to be in there for an hour and talking? Maybe it was, but maybe at the end of it, you're like, oh, I don't really feel more anxious now. Or so to really tune into those feelings. Totally. And I think you can decide, like, you don't have to just like quit Instagram or quit Facebook. You can delete it off your phone for a couple of weeks and see how that feels. You know, you can experiment with a bunch of different things. You don't have to make like huge permanent changes to the way you're existing. Uh, you can experiment and pull the different level levers and see, you know, what's feeling better, what's feeling worse. You know, is it better when you're not listening to the news as much? Is it better when you, you know, have deleted Twitter, Facebook, Instagram off your phone? You know, wh what are those kind of like rules that you're making up? Up and how can you keep iterating on them and making them better? And also, I would add, you know, a lot of times what makes us feel good isn't necessarily something that we would be like super proud to share about on Instagram or Facebook. You know, I feel like there's this weird like winning at quarantine kind of thing. Like, oh, who are the people who are like learning how to cook and baking their own bread and like doing yoga every morning and like look Bullshit. at how mindfully I'm spending my time and now I'm you know, a monk, it's like, okay, I get that that's, that's really great for some people. But sometimes it's honestly like binging Real Housewives of New Jersey, it doesn't have to be some like highbrow philosophical exchange, it can be trashy and enjoyable. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been down a small rabbit hole of so bad, <laughs> too hot to handle on Netflix. <laughs> oh, no, okay, I have not watched that. I have so, not watched that one yet. So freaking bad. So good. Okay. I did have a little love is blind thing before too. I'm like, oh, my okay. God. But yeah, and it's sort of like those <laughs> that soothing behavior. So I used to have like a major shopping issue when I can times of stress, I literally I'd be like, bye. And out I'd go to the mall and like walk around. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm gonna yeah. get something. And so if you find yourself online shopping or trying to like, you know, numbing whatever pain that you're feeling right now, because right now, you know, your plans could be put on hold and things that you want to do. It's, you know, it feels it can talk about ambiguity and uncertainty, like all of us are in, in that right now, and especially yeah. with, with infertility. So that's why that's the reaching out for connection and seeing what feels right for you. I do think that the infertility community has a secret advantage in this, which is like needing to be comfortable with not knowing how things are going to turn out, like needing to, to be comfortable with the with the discomfort. I mean, that's something that we've all had to deal with is we don't we didn't know how our stories were going to end. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if this cycle is going to work or this thing is going to happen. And so I think we might be a little bit more used to to feeling some of these these big feelings. It doesn't make it easier necessarily. And of course, we have our bad days, but it is definitely a feeling we are accustomed to. Yeah, I think I saw a meme about or um, something on Instagram about people in the fertility community have been self self isolating for months or years already, you know, <laughs> staying away, setting boundaries. Totally. It's like, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. We run a, we run a mindfulness group, had them, had the first one yesterday. And uh, as I'm recording this on the 22nd of April, yeah. Talking about that, where they're actually saying now that this is going on, I don't have the triggers of my coworker who was pregnant sitting beside mm -hmm. me. I don't have to see the, you know, babies out in, in public. I don't have to have all the family saying all these different things and being, you know, being thrown in my face on a regular basis. So Obviously, it's still around <laughs> us, but it's not so you can kind of pull back a little bit. Totally. I mean, and there's always going to be like, you know, the random person on Facebook complaining about being stuck home with their kids. And there's always going to be like triggers. You're going to be watching your favorite program and there's a baby 
plot line, you know, and that's just like part of the situation. But yeah, I do think that there probably are some unforeseen benefits and ways that we're unintentionally protecting ourselves right now too. Yeah. And also with a struggle too, even though you're on the journey right now and it's a struggle, which has a beginning, middle and end, like everyone else is in their own struggle too. And as you move forward, it'll be something else and something else. And so being able to to get some of these found, these foundational tools, starting with self-awareness as to what works for you, and then you can use them into the next struggle that you encounter. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's definitely something that never goes away, regardless of where you are and regardless of your, your fertility story. I think that's just like a life coping skill. And when things go sideways or you lose something, you're experiencing grief, you're angry, you're trying to bargain, you're getting towards acceptance. I mean, that's a life skill that everybody needs to figure out how to navigate for sure. And what about, so this is, we talked a little bit about this, but when when your family and friends don't get it, what are, what are <laughs> some, I hear this all the time when people are like, oh, I was explaining, you know, what I'm going through. And then we get that when, like you talked about that well-meaning advice and, and yeah, which just, and then it almost, it almost hurts more because you're like, you're my close friend and family members. Why aren't you why don't you hear me? Yeah, I think that's one of the weirdest parts about the experience is that it's not always the people that you think are going to be able to support you the best that do. You know, sometimes it's the people who you think might not really understand what you're going through at all who can connect the most easily. For me, uh, my quote unquote best friend from my whole life had no idea how to emotionally support me through this. And it was a really, really tough thing in our friendship. And at the same time, I realized that a lot of my friends who... Uh, could really empathize were some of my single friends, which I was surprised by because I thought, oh, maybe they wouldn't care or get it or, you know, I don't know what I thought, but I just thought like, wow, they're not going to really understand this pressure. But it was actually the opposite because they were feeling a lot of those feelings as well. My single friends who were, you know, wanting to meet someone and, you know, couple up and have a family. I think it was actually pretty similar to infertility where they really saw their life going a different way. They felt out of control. They were being pressured by society and asked all the time, you know, when are you going to meet someone? Where are you gonna meet someone? Have you tried this dating app? Have you tried this? Oh, my friend did this thing. Have you heard about this? Like Slap. basically a very, <laughs> yeah, a very similar emotional experience to infertility. So I was surprised that, you know, a lot of my friends who were single just like really understood uh, the type of pain I was going through. I will say also that, you know, before you even tell anyone, I think it's really important to acknowledge like that you are the one who gets to decide who hears your story, who is earn the right to hear your story. You don't owe this to anyone. You don't owe them updates. You decide what you'd like to share, how much you'd like to share, and when you'd like to share. And I think that's just something really important because because of today's culture, I think people feel like, oh, I either have to, I can't tell anyone, or I have to be some like advocate for infertility where I'm like posting about it publicly all the time. Like there's really... There are a lot of different ways that we can pull those levers of, you know, who's going to support us and who isn't. You know, we can dip our toe in the pool with somebody and see how they're reacting before we share a little bit more. And then we can decide, okay, who do we want to keep sharing updates with and who do we not want to anymore? And so I think it's important to just remember that you're the one who's in control and you can always reset your boundaries if you try something and it doesn't feel great. Yeah, a lot of times too, to be able to educate. So if you picked a few people to talk to, to speak with about this, to educate them how you want them to handle certain things. If there's, if you have a group of friends that are you know, trying to get pregnant as well, how they, how you want them to handle baby announcements or baby shower invites or things around that, that, that can be triggering for you. So, and a lot of times we may not even thought of, think of how we want that to be handled, but then that's kind of, that's empowering. Kind of like, oh wait, I would prefer if you, you know, texted it to me or, you know, instead of calling me or instead of you putting it out on Instagram first, that you would call me first because sometimes yes. people are like, oh, but you, the person didn't want to hurt the person. So they protected them and then they feel and there's like this pity so this is whole kind of messy stuff around it. You know, there, I do believe it is well-meaning. People just don't know what to do. People don't know what to do. And I think when you can tell them what you prefer, it really alleviates a burden on them. I think clarity is really kindness. And if you know that you prefer to hear news a certain way, or if you 
don't want to even be invited to a baby shower or if you, you know, whatever your rules are for yourself. I think if you can communicate those clearly to the people who you love, it's helping them be successful and supporting you. Um, I remember when we were actively trying when I would go visit my parents and we would be like taking a walk or something and my mom would always fuss and fawn over like if we saw a baby and I had to tell her like, can you please not make a big deal over it? Like when you see a baby, it's like very hurtful. And she didn't understand, you know, why that was necessarily. But the second that I said that, she was like, that's something I can do. I think people are looking for concrete ways to help you. It's so disheartening to be a friend and watch your friends struggling with anything, whether it's infertility, whether it's a loss in the family, whether it's a terrible health diagnosis, like whatever's going on, you want tactical concrete ways to help them. And if you can tell your friends and family what it is that they can do, I think that's a gift to them. Yeah, that's when someone passes away, people start cooking, they don't know what to do. Exactly, because there's really nothing you can do. I mean, no. it's pretty similar in that way. If someone, if someone's kid has a cancer diagnosis, if you know there's some horrible fire, like there's nothing that you can say to make it magically better. But what you can do is find ways to show up. And if the person gives you a directive or can tap you to something, great. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So let's talk about the type of support. We talked about this a little bit. So the type of support that can be more harmful than helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I am. I immediately go to social media because mm -hmm. I think that that ha can overall be good for us as a community, for sure. It's allowing us to see into the lives of other people. It's allowing us to connect with people who live geographically far away, who have very different lives than we do, who we might not necessarily ever be able to meet or see. That's amazing. I think where it gets problematic is in some of these group environments where you have a couple people really like dominating the conversation or giving medical advice or giving any type of advice that, you know, is only relevant to their own personal experience or, you know, basically anyone toxic who's like being really judgmental or, who, or who's creating an environment where people don't feel comfortable sharing. So I would really just be on the lookout for any type of dynamic in those groups and anything that doesn't sit well with you, you know, really listen to that. I think also there can be sometimes in the fertility community and one of the things I don't really love is this idea of like toxic positivity where it's like hang in there you got this never give up never ever give up and I think that's something that people mean well when they say that and they're trying to be supportive and a cheerleader but I think that can be really really damaging for people and what we need to do is give people in the community permission to pursue their family in ways that feel good to them and also give people permission to stop treatment if it's not serving them. Yeah it comes back to that self-awareness I know the the hope thing and the you know just believe, which then puts the blame back on someone that's struggling. So it is to be able to, and then I think that when you're talking about judgment, there's like obviously a lot of self judgment on this and feeling potentially that it is your fault. Yeah. And then with it, with the social media side of things, some of those, yeah, like if you're in something and it's combative and people are going back, cause I, I was in a bunch of them for a while and I had to leave because mm -hmm. just, they, yeah, there's certain people that will dominate the conversation and it just becomes potentially unhelpful unless, you know, to me though, if you're going, you're getting medical information from a Facebook group, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, obviously that's not the place to go for that type of information or advice, but I mean, I just really think that there are, even in like the best parts of this community, there are going to be times and places where things don't feel right or don't sit right. And that's really just, you need to be able to listen to that alarm bell and be able to get yourself out of there rather than feeling like committed somehow um, or stuck. And I think that's kind of where we keep talking about boundaries. It's, you know, you don't owe anyone anything and you have the right at any time to say that a relationship or a friendship or a community is no longer serving you. And that's okay. You can, you can be the one to say, hey, I'm taking a break. And you don't even like owe anyone that. So I think too often women, we fall into this role of being people pleasers and we want to like be nice and make friends and we don't want to be the B word. <laughs> We're just also scared of that. So we try really hard to be on our best behavior. But the reality is like you have to take care of yourself first and your own mental health. That is priority. Yeah, that's the boundary piece. And it's interesting if you want to generalize with men and women. Women want to say, no, I can't, I can't attend because of blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Men are like, men are like nope, can't, can't, you know, can't make it. So it's interesting when yeah. we want to justify and put all these things in just saying, nope, can't do it. Because I think too often women are, our self-esteem comes from serving other people and from being selfless and from sacrificing our own desires for the desire of our partner or our friend or our community. And, you know, look how 
with how much I've sacrificed. And we're starting to learn that that doesn't lead to very happy women and it doesn't lead to a very satisfied woman, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And now this is an interesting one. So what about if we feel resistance asking for support? So you're like, you know, you're this type yeah. A, you've got it all going on and everything else is, is working other aspects of your life. And you're like, oh, I don't need help. I, I think our society now is changing that, you know, I'm feeling that the change that it's, it's brave to ask for support, to, to, to ask for what you need. But sometimes we may not even know, like we could be stuck in the middle of the struggle and we're, we're working a way to try to solve it or fix it. We may not even see ourselves in there and we're like, I, I got this. I don't need any help. I can read the blogs and figure out what to do myself. How do we recognize that? I think that's a really tough question. I think the resistance is honestly part of the experience. And I think that's that's a very normal feeling to have where a lot of times we don't realize that we need help until it's a little too late. And not too late, like don't even bother getting help, but too late, like things have gotten to a point where it might not have gotten that bad if you had gone to get help earlier. So I think realizing and recognizing that voice of like, oh, that isn't for me or like, oh, I'm not there yet. Or, oh, I think I don't really need this. I think that's important to, to hear your voice saying that and ask yourself, like almost calling BS on yourself. Like, okay, am I, why am I resisting this? Am I resisting this because I have a valid reason why? Or am I resisting this because I'm uncomfortable? And it's okay to be uncomfortable. I mean, we're all uncomfortable trying new stuff. We're all uncomfortable getting help and raising our hand and saying, I'm not doing well. I mean, nobody uh, wants to be the person to, to say, help me, please. We all want to be the helpers. <laughs> So I think really just understanding and being able to recognize when you're you're resisting and being able to call BS on yourself and saying, okay, is this valid? Is this fair? Could this help me? Am I resisting this because I don't need it? Or am I resisting this, resisting this because I'm uncomfortable? I don't have the emotional energy to do this right now. What are those reasons why? How valid are they? And are they things that I can work around? Are they things that might be worth it later? Or are they really just, you know, excuses? Yeah, this is interesting. I coach a lot of type A busy professionals, like I was saying, and mm -hmm. and it is interesting with that feminine masculine energy. Like we're all like ambitious, achieving, pushing, and then to go and the feminine energy is just it's just as valuable as being vulnerable and listening to our intuition. And this is that that key if there's resistance in there, like getting getting quiet to to listen to, well, what what's going to feel right for you? And looking for those those signs because they're all around you. And you know, especially being in a corporate environment, a lot of that intuition and our gut feeling has been just beaten out of us. So mm -hmm. like, it took me years to get mine back again because it was like, oh no, you think this is right? And I'm like, every freaking time I went against what my gut was saying, <laughs> just screwed up. So it's yeah. interesting to be able to like listen to those little, little intuitive hits that you get and you're like, oh, wait a minute, something's out of alignment. Something's not quite right. How do I ease into, because a lot of times we're, you know, we got our stomachs all con contracted, our shoulders are up tight. How do we like wiggle ourselves out a little bit and say, wait a minute, what's like, what do, what do I really need right now? And it can be really, really hard to know that. I mean, because we are used to this narrative of saying like, oh, you know, oh, I'd like to go to that support group, but you know, you know, my, my husband needs to be at home. I need to cook dinner. Oh, well, you know, it is easy to come up with these reasons why. Um, but it's also important to know like, what is, what's a valid reason for not going to that? Like if, like this support group example, pretend COVID's over, okay? And you're trying to decide, do I want to go to this in-person support group? You know, obviously that's an uncomfortable situation, but it is, could be, you know, a huge benefit where if you go and you open up and you're vulnerable, you could feel better, you could make some new friends, it could be really great. Um, and then you have to ask yourself like, okay, is this something I really want to do? Is it worth, you know, the money if it's, if it's a paid event, do I have the time to go do this? Is this something that I want to do? Is this the venue that, you know, the avenue that feels good for me? Or would I rather do something, you know, virtually or would I rather read a book or do something, you know, more passive as opposed to, you know, going out into the world and sharing my story. And I think you know yourself best and you know what you need. And I think as long as you can get through all like, the weeds of the excuses we make up for ourselves, and you can really listen to the heart of what you need. I mean, that's, that's the number one piece of advice with all of this is like the faster you can cut through your own BS, <laughs> the better off you're going to be. 
Oh, yeah. I know. Sometimes we don't know it's that burden that we're this heaviness that we're carrying around until you're like able to get it out. <laughs> then you can yeah. you know, feel the lightness. You're like, oh, my goodness, I didn't even know I was carrying that around with me. Yeah, um, I think that's like, you know, we're all just like craving that clarity. And I mm. think, you know, it takes us a little while to get there. And we all have our own process. But once we get there, and we can see a little bit more into, you know, what do what what is working for me? What's serving me? And what really is it? And so why are you finding it's important to get support from someone who's on the other side of the struggle? Well, for me, I found that it was very helpful to talk to other people who had been through infertility uh, diagnoses, treatments, who really understood the process, who spoke the language, who knew what a lot of these acronyms meant, who knew what cycle day one was, who knew what a frozen embryo transfer was, who knew what an embryo was and how that was different from an egg and how that was different from a retrieval versus a transfer. And I think there is just such a huge element of education, that if you can already talk to someone and you already know that same language, you don't have to spend all that time telling them all about and educating them about what's actually happening. So that was something that I thought was incredibly helpful when I was going through infertility was talking to other people who knew this language, who knew this world, understood the biology, understood the options and understood the emotions of what was going on. Because I think it just is so misunderstood by people who haven't been through it. And I think it's easy for people to say, you know, you should just be happy, look at all you have, you know, it'll happen if it's meant to be. Why don't you just adopt? There are so many kids out there who need this. You know, you're so privileged you can be able to afford this. And I think if you can talk to somebody who knows what not to say almost, <laughs> like that's half the battle. Yeah, absolutely. Those those things, those triggers that, that have people go down a, a spiral of either grief, you know, or anger a lot of the times. And so, yeah, being able to have someone who's got that perspective and wisdom. Yeah, like you're saying with, with the acronyms, because there's a lot of acronyms in this, this, this <laughs> whole thing. It's like, <laughs> there are. And I think also, like, I mean, it's not unique to infertility. Like the system of talking to somebody who's been do something similar to you. People have been doing that forever. We've been doing that in tribes, like as long as there's been humanity. Like we're constantly looking as human beings for people who can understand us and who know where we're coming from and who can empathize with us and who can really help sit with us when we need that help. And I think that's really all this is doing. It's no different from any kind of program that would connect people who, you know, are going through a breast cancer diagnosis or going through a diabetes diagnosis. I mean, really, there are so many, we live on this planet with millions and millions of people and all of our stories are unique, but also all of our human emotions and feelings are so similar. And so if we can just kind of cut out all the crap and get to the root of like, who can understand me and see me and support me and hold space for me rather than trying to talk me out of something or cheerlead me or fill me with platitudes, you know, that's real connection. And that's the stuff that keeps us going on those really, really dark days. Yeah. So that active listening to actually being heard. That's like I'm coaching couples. A lot of the times it is, it is helping. You, know, you could be saying something, but someone's not actually hearing it. So having someone who can actually, you know, make space and hear what you're saying and then acknowledge it and validate it back to you that you're not, you're not losing your mind because of it. And that's when the burden starts, starts to, um, release. And it is both the simplest thing in the world, active listening, and the hardest thing in the world. Oh, for sure. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's like, oh, just, oh, all I have to do is listen. Okay, what? that sounds really easy. And then you try to do it and you're like, okay, now I understand why this is so hard for other people. And I mean, this is also why I think that people like fertility warriors end up making really good friends and are just really empathetic people themselves because we learn, you know, what doesn't feel good to hear. We learn what, you know, what not to say to the person who just lost their partner, who, you know, is going through something really tragic. You know, we've learned, okay, here are all the things not to say. Here's how I can show up and support this person. Here's how I can listen without trying to make everything okay. I know. And it's another, this might be a trigger, but it is a time to mother yourself and really, you know, look through things that are, that push your buttons and deal with some of those things now, um, to help, you know, to help you have that toolkit as you, as you go through life. So it is to be back to that self-awareness side of things and what feels right for you. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so is there a, anything you're obsessed with right now, be it a, a book or a website, an app, a documentary, anything that you are just loving? Oh my gosh. That's a really good question. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, um, but I've been really into drawing lately. I mm. bought um, I bought this book that's called Twenty Ways to Draw a Cat, 
<laughs> and it's really cute. And it's not like an instructional drawing kit. It's pretty much just like doodles of animals. And the they have a series. So I just bought like the next one that's uh, 20 ways to draw a tree. Okay. It's more like nature drawing. So I've been like really filling my sketchbook with a lot of these doodles because I found that that's a really great way for me to disengage. Um, I've found that the news is a really big trigger for me right now. And so I've really done my best to delete Twitter and Facebook from my phone. Uh, a lot of the podcasts I used to love are news related and I haven't really been listening to those right now. So I've been trying to find other podcasts um, that are not about the news. I've been listening to like old episodes of This American Life and uh, a podcast I love is called Death, Sex and Money, which is also about like talking about things you're not supposed to talk about. So it does actually like relate a lot back to infertility sometimes. But a lot of their older episodes are more about, you know, the student debt crisis or about grief and loss and I just really connected with that type of content as well. Yeah, I love that with the art therapy too, with the, the 20 ways to draw a cat because it is, you know, I'm not, I'm not into drawing. Although when I think back when I was sitting at school, I, I've, I used to in the doodle all the time. And I, I was always, yeah. trying, it was interesting. I was always doing a box, you know, like the box on the side with, and I was trying to get the things to line up. I must have drawn like, <laughs> I don't know how many, but then I would like put little lines. It was like the weirdest. I was doing, I'm doing it now as I speak, but I'm like, and I, I, I don't doodle at all anymore, but yeah, there's something about that, like sitting down, either like being like being present with it, um, that can be very can be very helpful. So thanks, yeah, thanks for that. and we oh the lowbrow and the lowbrow thing that I've been obsessed with too is this show on Bravo that everyone probably has already seen, but it's new to me. Below Deck. Oh, is it with, so the, with the captain or the? the... Oh my god, I, it's perfect. It's like perfect <laughs> trash reality TV where it's like. There's enough at stakes where I'm like emotionally invested in what's happening, but it's not stressful at all. Yeah. I love it so much. <laughs> those are those Very ones good. that sound like I'm a huge like Bachelor fan. And I'm like, oh, and now I'm like, yeah. what's going to happen? Are they going to be able to film the next season? I don't know. But, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, some of those things <laughs> that are just like, oh, such trash. But it just takes you away from your 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 little life and um, yeah, someone else's crazy life. Yeah, and I mean that's like that's kind of what we're all doing right now with like the COVID stuff is like mm. we have to we have to vacation in our minds. <laughs> you know, we have to like find ways to to transport ourselves into these other places and be. And that's why I think the storytelling thing is so immersive and helpful and healing, where we can really listen, you know, and put ourselves in some of these documentaries and stories. And you know, that's the, that's the beautiful thing about books and movies and literature. Yeah, I'm done a whole um, book rabbit hole too. I've consulted the New York Times bestseller <laughs> list and I just pick from there. Um, oh, nice. Oh yeah, I love it. So is there a success story that you'd like to share? Sure, you have lots to, to share with your, with your program you offer there. Anything you'd like to? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm trying to think. There was somebody who had emailed us, and this was maybe a while ago. And we asked people, you know, how's it going? Uh, how are you? You know, we, we keep in touch with a lot of the people in our program. And someone had emailed us back and said that, you know, one of her mentees uh, had had a baby and she was ready to take on another mentee. And then she mentioned that she'd already had two or three mentees. Uh, and she said that they all get together <laughs> and they like hang out as a group, like the four of them. And so I thought that was just so awesome. Like, oh, wow. Okay. You connect people online and then they chat enough times and now all of a sudden they're all hanging out. So that was something I thought was really cool. Um, and we hear stories like that all the time. We hear stories of people who, uh, yeah, become friends in real life and end up joining the same running club or doing the same activity. Uh, it's just it's really awesome. And we also, we have people all the time who signed up to be mentees and get emotional support, then message us, you know, a year, two years later saying, hey, you know, this program changed my life and now I want to become a mentor. You know, I just had my my kid, our adoption just went through, uh, you know, I want to give back to this community. So I think that is really what speaks to, to what we're building at Fruitful is this idea of giving back and this idea of like, being that safe person, being that person who can help guide and support and actively listen and not try to like tell you that it's going to be fine and isn't going to say all like the wrong things. So that's really what I'm most excited about with Fruitful. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Creating that community. So, so rewarding. And you have a, um, so they can go to uh, fruitfulfertility.org and they can get a 20% yep. discount. We'll, we'll be putting the code in the show notes, but it should be Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile. And what can they uh, get there on, uh, with your with your program? Yeah, so when you sign up uh, to be a fruitful mentee, 
you will sign up, you'll be asked a bunch of questions about how long you've been trying, how old you are, if you have a diagnosis. And then we ask a lot of questions too about your worldview. You know, do you believe everything happens for a reason? Um, are you in the military? Are you a single mother by choice? Are you an LGBTQ family? Uh, what are you interested in? What kind of music do you like? And then we take all of these different factors and we use those to help match you with a mentor who's been through a similar experience and can help guide and support you. So whether you're dealing with male factor, secondary infertility, uh, unexplained, whether you're you know six months in or two years in, we're going to find someone who can talk to you. And really what you'll do is you'll sign up. Uh, we have a $50 fee, um, but that'll be 20% off with the code in the show notes. Uh, you'll be matched with a mentor and you'll be able to chat with them through our app. And that's really, it's sort of like, um, like a Alcoholics Anonymous meets Bumble, but for infertility <laughs> is kind of how we explain it. And then you'll have your mentor and you'll be able to chat with them and they'll be there to help emotionally support you, you know, as you navigate a lot of these emotions, some of the appointments and really help be that person for you who gets it when the rest of the world seems to just not get it. I love it. I just, I just love the whole, the whole setup of your, of your, of the program. It's just so that, that giving back piece is once you've been through this, you just, well, that's why I started my business. Cause I'm like, wait, like when I've discovered all all the functional medicine stuff and then you just want to like share yeah. and share your knowledge with others and and help others that were you know in the same position as you and it's so rewarding yeah and i mean that's kind of the coolest part is that you know when, when i had the idea for the system a lot of people were like well why would people want to sign up you know to help other people if they're not getting paid by people i mean men men were telling me that huh. Um, and I was like, well, I don't think you really understand women and I don't think you really understand trauma. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Like Absolutely. people want to give back. They want to share their story. They, they, what they want to do is they want to go back in time and tell younger them mm -hmm. all the things they learned along the way. Yes. And this is really your opportunity to do that too. So if you're someone who's on the other side of your fertility journey and you want to give back, you can sign up to become a mentor. We're always looking for, you know, awesome, empathetic, great listeners you know, who want to give back and who want to share their story and help inspire other people. Mm, I love that. So go to uh, fruitfulfertility.org and we'll have the discount code in the show notes. And thanks so much for coming on, Elise, and sharing your words of wisdom on this topic. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thanks for your podcast. I'm a huge fan and love the work you're doing and the message you're spreading. And just think this is a really important step. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend blue blocks, blue and green light sleep glasses to all our one-to-one -one clients. Simply go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the supercharger fertility discovery call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you are a U.S. resident, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E -E, to 55444. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20 minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to our heart. These simple yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. For U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E -E, to 55444. For non-U.S. residents, go to Yoga Freebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E, -E, to access your special gift. That's yogafreebie.com to access the free fertility yoga download. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. 
We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.